the, the return of Russell Wilson's calf injury. It's keys to victory time. What the San Francisco 49ers have to do to beat the New York Jets in week one. Ronnie Stanley calls out the referees, Isaiah Lightby and Roquan Smith. Can Texas take it to Michigan? Does Arkansas have a shot against Okie State? Texas is more than capable. You got suited up, you put your shoes on, you end up winning by a toe. The Locked On Podcast Network presents the Big Six in 60. The six biggest national sports stories from the local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Get the real story. Why it matters, what's next, who wins the big game, and more, all in 60 minutes. The Big Six in 60 starts now with the biggest story in sports. You got suited up, you put your shoes on, you end up winning by a toe. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs podcast. The Chiefs ran their game and they did a lot of good work. Matt Derrick, the editor of ChiefsDigest.com, our man on the beat, just got out of the locker room and is still at the stadium joining us live with Chris Clark. You'd see him up here over at Chiefs Corner. I'm Ryan Tracy from NFL 33, RGR Football, and Rogue Analytics and Performance Consulting. Thank you for making us your first listen. Or maybe your uh, your first Locked On listen right now. Check out another Locked On show later. As we're going to break it all down for you, you can even get that much more on the text line, even during the game at 816-357-87. 81. We have to get to the things later, the minuses about what can be improved, what struggled tonight. That's coming up later in the show. A couple of missed opportunities, but there were a lot of opportunities on the pluses side coming up later. But we start, you just can't get an easy game. The Chiefs, I don't care whether it's the Super Bowl or whether it's week one, they're just not going to let you rest easy. They're going to take it down to the wire. This one was no doubt. Thank you to Lamar Jackson and uh, the Baltimore Ravens for coming out. <laughs> Clearly, uh, they feel that the Chiefs are at the top of their game already. I don't think they understand yet. But, Matt, to pull a win like this with so many young players on the roster, so many guys contributing by literally the the nail on a big toe, what does that do for this team? Have they dodged the bullet, or is, is there a sense of relief or a sense of, hey, we got to clean our act up? <laughs> uh, probably a little bit of both. Uh, there, there was certainly a lot of uh, phrasing and terminology around the locker room and in the post-game press conferences about uh, needing having some things to clean up from this game, and, and there certainly is. Uh, even uh, individual players uh, to a team, we were talking about some of the things that they can clean up individually. Everybody had a little bit of, you know, it was uh, week one, so everybody was a little bit imperfect. Um, not sure that there was anybody with a truly great performance outside of maybe Xavier Worthy, <laughs> maybe Chris Jones, because Chris Jones had a pretty good night too, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's week one, so there's plenty to clean up. Referees probably had some things to clean up too. Maybe we'll talk about that as well. But um, I, I don't. It wasn't like a massive sense of relief. I think that you know part of it is that this team still has a great deal of confidence. I think they think they're the better team um, than the Ravens. So I think there was a little bit of this that they expected to win and they won. Uh, but there's no doubt. There's there's a few things to clean up out of this one. You know, when I look at this game, I, one of the, my biggest keys was slowing down Derrick Henry. And Kansas City held him to, what, 40 yards on the night? 46 yards on 13 carries, three and a half yards a carry. That is shutting down Derrick Henry. Uh, I wouldn't say that for some of the other running backs in the NFL, but that's shutting down Derrick Henry. Uh, that is a phenomenal job by the Chiefs defense to be able to get that done. Yes, they ended up giving up 122 yards to Lamar Jackson. Uh, but I will say this, and, and I kind of said this uh, talking on the Locked On NFL show or Locked On Today earlier, uh, this is the first game of the year. This is the first time these guys have played more than 30 or 40 snaps in a game. And some of them didn't even get double-digit snaps in most games in the preseason. So this is going to be something where they're going to get – uh, you know, a little bit more conditioning, and I think that they'll be better down the road. But they had a lot of snaps, especially late in this game, uh, that they struggled on, and I think that's something to, to look at. But they win by a toe. Uh, Likely's toe, Likely's big toe did not come down in bounds. And uh, but the reality about that is, is that if Lamar Jackson actually throws balls on the two previous plays better, it doesn't come down to that, and maybe they go to overtime at that point. So. Although it looked like they were going for two. Yeah, that was it's definitely if that play had been um, upheld and it had been a touchdown, it certainly looked like the Ravens were going for two. They had their offense on the field. 
uh, Jim Harbaugh was signaling for two. So uh, John Harbaugh rather. Um, so yeah, I fully expected that if that, that touchdown had stood, that they were absolutely going to go for two. And that would have been probably an even more dramatic finish uh, yeah. coming down to one play. It certainly would have been on the plus side. They ran the ball hard. They stuck with it. There was about a 60 40 split uh, pass to run here. I thought it was controlled by the offensive uh, game calling. Uh, the run game was there. A little bit of Carson Steele, a lot of Isaiah Pacheco. You spread the ball around. I think, arguably, uh, yes, Xavier Worthy, bang for the buck in terms of number of touches. I feel like what we saw was a glimpse of the future, though, especially after Hollywood Brown returns in feeding Rasheed Rice underneath making those catches across the middle attacking where the defense has to be soft if they want to guard deep i think this is just a preview of more to come matt that was one of the things that stood out to me about the past game offense looked just in its infancy markedly better than i expected it to be in week one how did you take it yeah i mean the, the, so there's individual things that the chiefs did tonight that i just don't know how some teams are going to stop and and some of that is just you know putting together the individual pieces that they have. Uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes talked about it after the game, that just the mere presence of Xavier Worthy, that as the game, you know, wore on, um, the Ravens were using more and more shells to, you know, to, to defend him and try and make sure that he wasn't beating them deep. And they still had a busted coverage and it didn't work. Um, you know, and, and what's, you know, and Mahomes said, hey, that, that's going to happen early in the season. Defenses are going to take break down and you have to take advantage of it when they do. But then you look at Rasheed, uh, I don't know how a, a an undersized defensive back even is going to defend Rasheed Rice out of the slot. I mean, you're going to, if you're another team, you're going to have to find the guy that's six foot two to put him on because I, I think that is just going to be there all day long. Um, for Rasheed. I mean, it's just that he, I think he's too big and too vast to, to cover in that spot, unless that you've got some size and an ability to play with him. You definitely can't let him get free off the line of scrimmage. And the same is true with Worthy. I mean, you, you know, that, that touchdown throw was a great example of that. I mean, um, you get him off the line and you don't have any help behind, he's going to beat you. I mean, that's exactly what Tyreek used to do to people. So I think that there were some, certainly some individual pieces out of this game that you can say, okay, the Chiefs can build off of this. And there's a few things that, you know, once they do get Hollywood back, I think you're going to say, you know, it's going to be even even better. I mean, there's a lot, or a lot of reason to come out of this game, especially when you think about putting up 27 points on one of the three best defenses in the NFL last year. I mean, if you're putting 27 points up on the Ravens, what are you going to do against some weaker defenses? Well, and we're going to talk about some missed opportunities here in just a minute when we get to the next segment. But I want to say really quick, the thing that stood out to me, and I don't have final snap counts, so I can't give you the final tally, but I think I saw in the first, shortly after the first quarter and maybe into the second quarter, Rasheed Rice had 17 snaps. Xavier Worthy had 15. The reason I bring that up is because if you go back and watch last year, Rasheed Rice wasn't getting those kinds of snaps. Even in a game where they didn't have Travis Kelsey, he did get snaps, but he didn't get anywhere near what Worthy got. Worthy is going to be a big part of this offense, and he is ready for it. That's what you saw tonight, and that is what is most exciting to me. And don't get me wrong. I'm excited about bringing back Hollywood Brown as well. Don't, that's going to be phenomenal. But Worthy is a bona fide starter on this team right now, and he is showing that he has the ability to play uh, multiple snaps for the Chiefs. And, yeah, he only got three touches, but, man, he made him pay when, the, when he got the ball in his hands. Yeah, and the thing with you know all three of those guys, once Hollywood does come back, is that they're they're playing three different positions, so their the presence isn't going to affect the the, the workload of somebody else. Yeah. Uh, really, the only thing that's going to affect those in, the three individual players' workloads is how much do you want other players to rotate through in their positions, or how much of a break do you want to give them? How much do you want McCole Hardman to play? How much do you want Justin Watson? Uh, how much do you want to get Juju on the field? And so you know, and, and that to me, I mean, I think that. This is the first time in a long time that the Chiefs may have just three starting wide receivers that they prefer at each of those three individual spots. So, uh, you know, they don't have to do the rotation as much as they've done in the past. I don't think that they will. I mean, it's not that you're not going to see Xavier sometimes playing um, the, the X. I mean, I think he's going to be in the Z spot a lot. Doesn't mean you're not going to see him in the slot sometimes. But um, I, I you, you see what Rashid did in the slot tonight? I mean, there's yeah. a reason why he is going to be in that spot a lot this year. Game time makes getting to the ballpark even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. 
With killer last minute deals, all in prices and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals right up to the start of the event and even after it starts up to an hour. It's the place to find last minute seats. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the free app and new users can get $20 off their first purchase with code locked on. Terms apply. That's code locked on for $20 off your first purchase with Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, the lowest price guaranteed. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24 7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ronnie Stanley calls out the referees, Isaiah Likely and Roquan Smith. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Full disclosure, I recorded an entire episode of this just a couple minutes ago, just finished that up, and then... Kind of thinking about it, I realized, Kevin, you didn't talk about any of the key points that need to be talked about. Now, obviously, from a game perspective, I did. There were some late-breaking developments over the course of the past couple of hours. Full disclosure, it's 4.30 in the morning right now. And I I didn't really talk about those. Isaiah Likely, Roquan Smith taunting the Chiefs. Ronnie Stanley calling out the refs. And so what I decided to do is I'm going to just record this episode now. This will be the Friday episode. And then we're going to put out the other recording on Saturday. So we talked about positives, areas of concern, all that pretty general stuff. So that'll come out tomorrow. But today I want to talk about what Ronnie Stanley had to say, Isaiah Likely, Roquan Smith, because those were some late breaking stories. Maybe you're waking up to it with me here. Maybe I'm breaking the news to you, or you you saw it, went to bed, woke up, and now we're talking about it here. So no flaming me on the shirt, no roasting me. All right. I recorded these episodes back to back. So I'm not wearing the same shirt multiple days in a row. So when you see the episode come out tomorrow, it will be the same shirt. So no flaming me on the shirt, all right? I'm doing this. I value getting the biggest stories out, right? That's what we do here on Locked on Ravens. I'm going to talk about the game a lot. We'll talk about takeaways in the final part of the show and just a general overview of the game. But I, I did really just want to dive into this. And, you know, even though it's kind of flipping things around, that's what happens in the content game sometimes, and I love it. So we're talking about what happened with both Ronnie Stanley, Isaiah Likely, Roquan Smith. Let's, let's start with Ronnie Stanley. Look, we know the refs were a big part of the game last night. No, no one can sit here and tell me they weren't. Now, I'm not a person who just wants to say, oh, the refs are the reason the Ravens lost the game. I'm not that type of person personally. Right? I think that the Ravens or any team, don't put yourself in the situation to have the refs win or lose you the game. But when the refs have fingerprints on the game, you have to talk about it. And when the refs have fingerprints on the game, you have to acknowledge they were a part of the reason why a certain team won or lost. And so to me, the refs can be a part of the reason, but they can't be the only reason. And I think that last night the refs were a reason, a reason. Now, Ronnie Stanley ended up talking about the refs after the game and kind of was talking about how he was and the Ravens were told one thing during the off season. But then in the game last night, that wasn't really held up. They were calling it differently. You know, that that's tough when, you know, you, you ask questions, right? The officiating Ronnie Stanley didn't feel like it was consistent, which I also agree. We'll get into that. But if you're, you know, getting talked to in the off season and you're like, Oh, okay. Doing things good. Right. He says they got clarification in the off season on expectations, but that didn't seem consistent with what was being called in the game. Obviously, apparently, the illegal formations that happened are a big emphasis point. They're a big emphasis point, and that's fine. But call it both ways if you're going to do it. And Ronnie Stanley, you know, making it very clear that they were told one thing, and then the other thing happened. And then on the other side, Jawan Taylor, who was, again, just leaning back on every play, and that's a – 
you know, you're false starting there, essentially. He's also lining up in the backfield, kind of like what Ronnie Stanley was doing. Honestly, a little more egregious. And it wasn't called. The Ravens had five legal formation penalties total. The Chiefs had none. The Chiefs had none. So Ronnie Stanley calling out the refs here. Honestly, good for him. You know, I, I think that, look, refs have to be held accountable. If it's a new thing they're dealing with, okay, but then call it both ways. If Ronnie Stanley's getting penalized for him and then Jawan Taylor's getting penalized right back, there'd be no issue. It'd be annoying. But it's like, okay, if you're if you're calling it that way, if that's the way the league is going to call it this year, then that's fine if you're doing it both ways. It's like in baseball where an umpire will have one strike zone for one team and another, another strike zone for another team. And that's not fair. <laughs> it's just it's, it's not something you do. The, the game is being officiated the wrong way. And we saw John Harbaugh talking to the officials, giving them an earful during the game about how the game wasn't being called consistently, wasn't being called on both sides that way. And like you, it's it's tough to kind of go through that because you're getting penalized for things the other team is not. And that's tough. It's something that teams shouldn't have to deal with. It's either you call it one way and then you call it that way for the other team too, or you don't call it at all. It's not one way for one team and another way for another team. That's one of the big frustration points. It would not be an issue if the Chiefs also got called for those plays. And people will look at the box score and they'll say, well, Kevin, the Chiefs had six penalties and the Ravens had seven. Guess what? It was not the same types of penalties. It was not the same types of penalties. You could even talk about the plays that were not called penalties for the Chiefs. One that apparently just has no punishment whatsoever. Steve Spagnuolo running down the sideline and calling a timeout. When assistant coaches are not allowed to do that. The head coach is the one that does that. Now, apparently Andy Reid was calling a timeout or something, and, and he he was acknowledged, and then Spagnuolo, but Spagnuolo's running down the sideline anyway. Like, what's he doing? He's trying to call the timeout. He's trying to do it. And you could see him walking back to Andy Reid and saying, uh, you know, kind of like patting him on the shoulder, like, my bad, I'm sorry. And then the ref comes up to Spagnuolo and, and Reid and says, you can't do that. Now, if again, I haven't seen any footage of Andy Reid actually calling the timeout. I've just I've seen a couple of people who either were there or just say that Andy Reid called it. But the, the thing that's being shown is Steve Spagnolo, an assistant coach, is calling a timeout when you are not allowed to do that from the sideline like that. And it just goes unchecked, it goes unpunished. So we'll see what ends up happening, see if any footage comes out or what happens. But the fact of the matter is, okay, well, then what was Steve Spagnuolo doing? What was he doing? He was trying to call a timeout. Doesn't doesn't excuse the fact that he was trying to do it, right? Even if Andy Reid was trying to do it, he was unsuccessful, and he's trying to get somebody's attention, Spagnuolo can't go down and do it for him. And, and that's what happened, right? There was an egregiously soft ticky-tack hold call on Tyler Linderbaum that negated a 30-yard Lamar, well, like, technically 29, right? I'll take off the extra yard. 29-yard Lamar Jackson run. It was just all that stuff. But Ronnie Stanley, I think he has a point here of like, look, if you're told one thing in the offseason, you're like, all right, yeah, this is within the realm of what we're looking for here. You know, you're, you're doing this the right way. And whatever that conversation was, I don't know what the conversation was, but whatever it was, and then the literal opposite thing happens, and it costs you yards. What was it, three on the first drive, three in a row? Was it? It was either four on the first drive and three in a row or three on the first drive. Three. I can't remember exactly. It was just so many of them. It's, it's unreal. But you have to call it both ways. You, you, you have to do it, especially in a professional league, biggest league on earth in football. And you're, you're not calling the game both ways. You know, is, is he being made an example of, right? That's something that got brought up. Like, is he being made an example of? That's a big conversation point. Was that something that happened? Lamar Jackson even said, seemed like every time he made a big play, a flag is down. I mean, it was true. Now, again, there were legit penalties the Ravens committed. I'm not saying they are free of all sin and they didn't commit any penalties. They did. That roughing the passer on Namdi Matabike. Yeah. I mean, it was a soft roughing the passer call, but textbook you're not allowed to it's hands to the face of a quarterback even if you're not slamming his head into the ground or anything textbook i'll let that one slide even though it was kind of soft it, it's it's spot you can't put your hand on the head of a quarterback you'll get called for it 
So I'll give that one by Matabike a, a pass. But then it's like Jawan Taylor is also leaning back for false starts. Like I talked about, like every single play it's happening. They're not calling it. The only false start they called on him was the one for the one where he was moving and everybody else wasn't the, the, the obvious one. There was, I think, a makeup call on Marcus Williams when he went low on Pasha Mahomes. Obviously, for the one that, I mean, Roquan said Mahomes flopped. It was a pretty late hit out of bounds. Out of the two, I would have probably called the Roquan one and not the Marcus Williams one. But, again, it's just the, the refereeing was super inconsistent. Not saying it's the only reason the Ravens lost. They did enough of that themselves. They had plenty of mistakes and plenty of concern areas. So, we'll dive into that. We did for tomorrow's episode. But... Ronnie Stanley and, and Lamar Jackson, these other guys calling out the refs and, and not really, you know, happy. John Harbaugh, not happy with the way that this game went from that side of things. The, the return of Russell Wilson's calf injury. What you are locked on Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. Right. Was the end of this week thrown for a loop when we got the Russell Wilson information? Just a little bit. We're going in thinking smooth sailing. It's week one. There's excitement. Things are building. And then obviously the news after practice on Thursday comes out. Russell Wilson uh, was limited in practice with that calf injury. It is the same calf that he yes. um, injured during training camp as well. So this is absolutely something to be keeping a big eye on here. It absolutely is. And, it, you know, the last time we heard about Russell Wilson having a calf injury, we're like, oh, it doesn't seem that serious. And then we didn't see him for like a month. Uh, and Justin Fields ran the first team off. And so, Jenna, that's my thing here. I it, We don't know how serious this is. He could have just been getting it looked at. He could be out there practicing Friday. But that, to me, now means the top thing to watch if you are a Steelers fan is that Friday practice report. Is Russell Wilson still limited, not practicing, full participant, that may very well give give uh, uh, the best light we will see to see if he'll start week one or if it ends up being Justin Fields as the Steelers starting quarterback in their opening game. Yeah, no, absolutely. After practice two on Thursday, Mike Tomlin was very short in the way that he answered questions. He kind of basically said it doesn't appear. It's not something he himself is worried about long term. They are having Russ get evaluated as a over precaution of abundance, what I believe, or abundance of precaution. I think that was the exact phrase that Mike Tomlin used. Um, and that they do feel very comfortable with Justin Fields as well, if that is something that they need to do. But yeah, tomorrow or later th today, watching for that practice report, watching if Russell Wilson talks with reporters, those are going to be two really key signs to lean one way or another towards his availability for what it may be on Sunday. Absolutely. Well, we, we will keep you up to date with that here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'll be driving to Cincinnati to cover Pitt Cincinnati, but I'll be keeping my eye keen for that. And we'll try to get you an update on our YouTube page and all our different social medias. But I wanted to talk about what would have been the main topic for today if it wasn't for that news. And that's a big topic that I think is is might not be talked about enough with, with the Steelers facing the Atlanta Falcons. This Steelers offense, everyone's going to be wondering what it's going to look like. And a point brought up by Aaron Freeman on our crossover Thursday episode of Locked on Falcons. Uh, Aaron Freeman brought up, he's like, hey, you know, watching Arthur Smith and, and looking at his offenses, if his offensive line was bad, he was bad. And, and that's and that played a, a big factor. And, and we know the Steelers offensive line, Isaac say, I'm always not playing in this game. Spencer Anderson starting for him. Fal Troy Faltano has been practicing. He was a full participant. That's a very good sign. But Broderick Jones looks like he's going at right. Dan Moore at left. Zach Frazier is going to be making his first start in his first game ever as an NFL player. So lots of newness there. And with newness is going to come the challenge of trying to protect them from having to do too much in the game. I asked offensive coordinator Arthur Smith about how he goes about that. Listen to his answer here. It's really kind of a non-answer because he acknowledges, like, I'm not going to give away my secrets. But listen to how he talks about that offensive line and what he's what he's what what the Steelers are going to have to do with them. Arthur, what, what are some things you can do as a coordinator when you have a young offensive line like you yeah. guys, guys making their first starts against a front with Jarrett, with, sure. with, with Jude on? What are things you can do to make it easier on the offensive line uh, throughout their first game like this? Well, I don't want to give away too much strategy. It's a great question. So let them figure that out on Sunday. Uh, how it is. I mean, that's, again, that's part of the coaching. They're going to have matchups every week. They got a very veteran group. Regardless of how much time they spent together, this isn't Matthew Judon's first rodeo, Justin Simmons' first rodeo. So they do. They've got experience. Right? They've gone all in. They've added. They've got some really good defensive players. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a challenge week in and week out, regardless of the opponent. So there's 
you know, those are things that I can figure out on Sunday. I don't want to give it away. Uh, sorry. Arthur, Arthur, to that point, week? how have Zach and Spencer kind of fit in and, and with these roles in their first starts coming up on Sunday? Well, they've done a good job before. They've got a lot of confidence. Again, until you get in, in the stadiums and, you know, it's first time for everybody. It's, you know, everybody's been in that position. Um, and so I got a lot of confidence in them, and now we got to go do it. Do it for, for real. When there's consequences and they're keep they're keeping scores. Uh, so over there, excited, and we had a lot of faith that we wouldn't put them out there. So you know, obviously, it's kind of acknowledging, like, hey, like we we know that this is a young offensive line. It's going to be the pace of the NFL. First real action for Frazier and Anderson in the, in these situations. I think it's a good acknowledgement of him. But it, of course, he's not going to say what they're going to do because then the Falcons are going to look for that. But you have to think this is one of those early tests for Arthur Smith. How does he help guide this offense in a direction that allows it to do the things that it wants to do without? trying to rely too much on this young offensive line to have to dominate the line of scrimmage. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's been so much talk, obviously, this whole offseason about this offensive line wanting to dominate within the trenches. They want to be the most physical team. They want to push you back. They want you to feel their presence in the way that is Steelers football and this, you know, mean toughness intensity that they bring. So I think that's going to be a massive factor in this game, too. But I also think one of the biggest benefits in having some of these young guys is that on paper, Zach Frazier and Troy Fautanu aren't young in just terms of, I mean, yes, age-wise, of course, but in terms of their experience, they're two of the guys that have more college experience than some of the guys that have come in in the past, aka like a Broderick Jones. So I like the fact that they have a lot of experience under their belt. I think that's going to be a massive aspect into what they do and what they can do well. But yeah, this is, I mean, it's a tough task week one, just kind of coming in and saying, hey, you're facing two elite pass rushers. At the same time, what we saw last year, even out of Dan Moore, was consistency in that too. So I think there's a lot to like, but at the same time, this is something where I don't think Arthur Smith is going to be putting a lot on these guys' plates just based on their inexperience and having such a young group as a entirety in that way. Absolutely. Also caught up with Najee Harris. We got some thoughts from him on the offensive line and also on how Arthur Smith has been as a coordinator. Here's Steelers running back Najee Harris. Najee, are there things that you guys can do as, as the veteran players on offense to help a young offensive line when they're getting their legs under them in an early game, season game like this? You said, is there? Are there things that you guys like plan to do like as leaders to help the young offensive line? Get um, just make them feel comfortable. Um, you know, uh, best way to get best way to get experience is obviously playing. Uh, they got some reps in, they got some reps in um, preseason. Um, you know, we do all we can in, in meetings, um, keep them calm, and you know, to point out the obvious. You know, they got some we got some guys playing that are, that are young, and you know, as a defender, you know, if I was going against them, you know, you want to pick on those guys to see if they are ready to play or not. So they know that they're aware of that and they're ready for the challenge. At the end of the day, you know, we trust them, and that's that's all that matters. How have you shown in the past your ability to make plays as a receive as a receiving back? As, are there things that you've seen Arthur Smith showing to you guys that you're going to be more involved in the offense in that way this year? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say too much. You know what I mean? But yeah. What has it been like having Arthur Smith as the offensive coordinator? What's like his, his coaching style? I like Arthur Smith as a coach, man. He's a he's a great coach. Him him just having control of the offense too. Um, I think that's that's a big thing. You know, he's shown that um, he's been there before. He's been in this position before. Uh, experience. Um, he gives good uh, examples about you know how maybe he was in Tennessee or he was in Atlanta. How certain situations or certain schemes come up and how to attack it. Um, you know, but just him as a leader, I think is. is a, is uh, is, is what pointed out to me the best of his comfortability of him being in this this position. Um, And I think that plays a big role in uh, in the football. So a a lot of different things there, both from Arthur Smith and Najee Harris. But I think bottom line is that this team, this team is trying to still – I think this team has a more pointed direction than it's had in several years now for what the offense wants to be. And, yes, there's bumps in the road, but I think that there's a maturity – to knowing that those but like hey acknowledging hey yeah sure young guys in the offensive line new new stuff here new stuff there but we have we have a plan this is how we're going about it and i think that's kind of refreshing to hear after the dismay that we've kind of seen inside the steelers offense with under matt canada for the past few years 
Well, yeah, you go back to the end of last season when this team didn't know its identity. They didn't have an offensive identity. You talked to multiple guys on the team, whether it was Najee, whether it was Kenny Pickett, any of these guys would tell you, hey, look, we don't entirely know what our offensive identity is. And I think when Arthur Smith came in, he came in with a plan and said, this is the team that we are going to be. We are going to run the football well. We're going to use play action well. All of these types of things that set things up for them to have success, for them to be successful. Well, again, acknowledging that there are a lot of young guys on this team, and I think his leadership is something not only we're seeing guys like Pat Fryermuth, like Najee Harris, who haven't maybe entirely had that. They've had to become the leaders in that room at young ages. This leadership is something that is going to propel this team to be able to not only have that offensive identity, but to find success in ways that we haven't necessarily seen in years past. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel any time. For that $5 bet, you could look at an NFL future. Everyone wants to be a number one receiver who will lead all wide receivers in yards. FanDuel has three players with odds 9-1 to one or shorter. FanDuel has Tyreek Hill, the favorite to lead the league in receiving at plus 650. CeeDee Lamb right behind him doesn't have a contract. Plus 750. And then Justin Jefferson checks in at 9-1. to one. Interestingly enough, both Amon Ross St. Brown and Jamar Chase have 11-1 to one odds. And I like both of those a lot. So I'm going to say Brown in particular on that one. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's keys to victory time. What the San Francisco 49ers have to do to beat the New York Jets in week one. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team Every day. We talked a little bit about some uh, what the 49ers have to do to win. we got more keys to victory today for uh, the New York Jets matchup in week number one. But before that, and um, Croc, it's funny because this was on my keys to victory. And uh, it, one of my keys was chill out. It's just week one. That was one of my keys to victory. And then I see today that Kyle Shanahan, uh, tells us that Christian McCaffrey's official injury designation is not just calf, it's calf slash Achilles. Croc. I don't like that very much. And Christian McCaffrey did return to practice, but I think you have to be smart, whether it's how quickly you put Trent Williams in their full go or Brandon Ayuk in their full go with the holdouts and the hold ins. And now Christian McCaffrey with the Achilles. Uh, this is a long season. And the 49ers might have to play 19 or 20 games here after the regular season playoffs and hopefully the Super Bowl. You don't want it to come crashing down on you in week one. Is there any chill mode for Christian McCaffrey? Because you know he's going to play. Is there any chill mode for Kyle Shanahan and his utilization of Christian McCaffrey? Because I, I just I don't like that slash Achilles designation. Maybe I'm making too much of this, Croc. No, I think anytime you hear the word Achilles, you get scared. Shoot, I've been running around with this uh, Achilles tendonitis. Every day I wake up really sore. It takes me about 10, 15 minutes for it to kind of warm up and for me to stop walking with a limp. And I am terrified at the age of 37 to just do something, right? Just messing around with my daughter in the soccer ball and then boom, feel like somebody kicked me and it's my Achilles gone. I've seen it with a bunch of buddies, a couple cousins. A lot of guys' Achilles go out as you get older and just the usage of it. and you know, you look at a guy like Christian McCaffrey, a lot of wear and tear. Uh, we talked about some of the injuries that he had uh, going to the 49ers. There were a couple like ankle injuries, little things like that. And when you start to hear that Achilles, especially attached to the calf, a calf injury that was he was working through last season. Like the calf thing, it's not a new injury. 
it was something that was kind of bothering him. And now you're hearing that Achilles attached to it. I think it is something we don't want to make like a huge deal out of it until the 49ers make a huge deal. It's not like they were like, all right, Chris McCaffrey, you're just uh, week one, you're on the shelf, or we're going to start you this, off on the season on the pup list. But they held him out of all the training camp. So I, I, maybe even if it's just as a precaution, all the preseason as a precaution, and now seeing it worded that way on the injury report, it, it is a little worrisome. It's kind of like the Pearsall injury where it's like, okay, you give it time, but it's still there. That That's what I don't like about it. And, and when you say Pierre Shaw injury, you're, you're not talking about the gunshot when you're talking no. about the shoulder, the shoulder no. injury that he's been dealing with, which they we found out they knew about this prior to drafting him. Or the draft. Just not like, oh, he'd be fine by game time. What's insane is a bullet entering the front of his body, exiting the back of his body might be a quicker recovery than whatever shoulder issue he had, which is, is mind boggling to me. Um, and, and I do hope that is the case for Ricky Pearsall, and he does recover from that gunshot wound very quick did you see where he got shot no is there more information on that i just saw the yeah, video was, of his red chest and, and that's all i know about it yeah no it was like bro, he people have posted this picture of him with his shirt off kyle shanahan said he got shot about two inches below where he has some prayer hands uh tatted on his chest and he has a big chest piece i mean it was like like in the middle of his chest like right above like the the nipple like it's not like it was like up here and kind of just went through it like went through one of the you know thickest parts of your upper body <laughs> gosh i mean so lucky that that didn't hit anything i mean that that's honestly insane um dre greenlaw last year had the achilles tendonitis and then in the super bowl he popped his achilles but it was actually the opposite leg that Dre Greenlaw hurt. So the Achilles tendonitis, I don't know if he still has it when he comes back from his actual Achilles injury uh, or if there's been enough time where he's better on the other side. But from what I remember, it was actually the opposite Achilles that he tore than the one that had the Achilles tendonitis that he had been dealing with. But I, I just don't like to start the season with that because that might be just a big underlying problem with Christian McCaffrey. I, I, just, I don't love that. I, I don't love that. Well, it's one thing to have like a little tight calf. You pull a caffeine cramp in training or whatever, but calf slash Achilles, I like a lot less. And a lot of times things like that happen because you're, you're overcompensating, right? Like right now, if you were like, all right, crop sprint, I would, the way I would sprint would be to take as much pressure off of my left foot, which is where I have my Achilles tendonitis. I would try to take as much pressure off of that and I would change the way I run. So now again, overcompensating now i'm overworking the right side and sometimes that is when you get those injuries now with drake greenlaw the way it happened it looked a little freakish right it's all right we're getting ready to go in the field okay the ball is down let's go oh damn somebody kicked me and he's just yeah. on the ground right like it just was like super freakish but the, the, you know maybe that it just reached its breaking point because of hey this whole season You've been battling this Achilles tendonitis on this side, and you've been overworking this side, and it was just that one step that that changed things for him. So hopefully that doesn't happen with Christian McCaffrey. Hopefully the time off has given him the opportunity to really just, hey, let's go about this the right way. I know the doctor told me, uh, he said, hey, the only way for you to heal this is to stay off of it. I'm like, dude, do you know who I am? I can't stay off. I coach high school football. I'm trying to run in a marathon. Like, like I, I'm not staying off of it. Uh, hopefully, Christian McCaffrey took the doctor's advice, stayed off of it, didn't do a whole lot, did his stretching, all the things to where maybe he's closer to 100%, whatever that is for, you know, 27-year-old uh, running back in the NFL. And you know what? My key to you, Croc, uh, is the same one that was my first key to victory. Uh, when you start talking about a marathon, Chill out. All right. Uh, <laughs> my advice is to not run a marathon. My, my <laughs> a therapist in San Francisco, every time there's a San Francisco marathon, half marathon, she has twice as many clients and patients because they get hurt trying to run a marathon. So I'm just throwing that out there at your, uh, at right. your life age. Chill out, Croc. I, I'll still, I'll stay away from the marathon. I'll still run the 10 K six miles. I can run six miles easy. There you go. I, I ran 10 miles last week. I thought it was just 
hey, just hold the same pace as you would run, you know, four miles or six miles. And once you just have your stride, you're good. It was drastically different. Just the last three miles, it was just torture all in my head. Felt like quitting the whole time. Couldn't do it. Probably wouldn't let me. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'll start reaching half marathon and marathons. I might just stick to the 10K. Game time makes getting to the ballpark even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals right up to the start of the event and even after it starts up to an hour. It's the place to find last minute seats. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the free app and new users can get $20 off their first purchase with code locked on. Terms apply. That's code locked on for $20 off your first purchase with game time. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, the lowest price guaranteed. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Texas is more than capable. You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football, getting you ready for the weekend. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth. Another weekend looms, and this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Will Sam Pittman take a step towards saving his job this week? And will Texas Tech avoid an early season stumble? They did last week. What's in store for them up in Pullman? That's all coming up on today's show. But we start with the game of the week. Texas at Michigan. Longhorns favored by seven and a half points, according to our friends at FanDuel. It was a smaller number, and then week one happened. If you would like to interpret that as an overreaction, it's one data point. Michigan didn't play very well, and Texas played amazingly, and they were playing a team from the same conference. And Fresno State might be better than Colorado State this year, but the Rams are not expected to be bad. They went into Austin and they got dog walk. Now, is Texas going to go into Michigan win 52 to nothing? No. But the reason I say they have everything they need to go and win this game and cover that spread is that everything that Michigan does well, that we know about Michigan or that we have questions about with Michigan, but still, you know, should be good, like the offensive line should be good, Texas has an answer for. Texas has an answer. Michigan's got a great defensive line. Might be the best in all of college football. It's certainly not outside the top five. Texas has a great offensive line. Now, last year, Washington had the best offensive line in all of college football. And they ran for under three yards of carry against this Michigan defense. And Michael Penix was pressured all day long. That could ha- that, that's how it goes sometimes. Best on best, sometimes you, sometimes me. See, I'm not finishing that with always us because it's an us versus you sort of comparison there. But I think that Texas's offensive line is really good. Michigan brings in a great new defensive coordinator. And who, who does Texas have calling plays? Oh, that's right, Steve Sarkeesian. Who's got the quarterback advantage in this game? I hope. Michigan fans, look, we've had our quarrels over the last couple of months. Please don't try and sell me on the fact there isn't a quarterback gap in this game. Was there when Michigan went up against Washington? I mean, yes, sort of, technically. Numbers-wise, yes, but J.J. McCarthy was taking just a few picks after Michael Penix. J.J. McCarthy was really good. In that game, J.J. McCarthy completed just 10 passes. He was 10 of 18, and yet Michigan won the game. Why? They ran for over 300 yards. Last week against Fresno State, it's just week one. 
It's a data point. It's not an entire season's worth of stats. Michigan ran for 4.4 yards of carrying 148 yards as a team. Donovan Edwards was held in check. That's going to have to change. Fundamentally, if Michigan is going to hang around in this game, they're going to have to be over 200 yards rushing because I have got no confidence in Davis Warren's ability to slice and dice the Texas defense. Colston Loveland is great. We know that. He might be the best tight end in all of college football. He's certainly one of them. He had eight catches for over 80 yards and a touchdown. The next leading receiver for Michigan had one, two, three catches. Three catches. I've got no confidence in this passing game. It's not what Sharon Moore wants to do. It's not what Davis Warren has proven himself to be capable of, and I don't think he knows who his favorite targets are outside of number 18 in the maize and blue. So I think this is going to be a really fun game, but Texas has got everything that they need. If the Texas offense gets going in this matchup, and this is why I like Texas to win the game, Michigan cannot keep up. This offense cannot keep up. Now, conversely, if the Michigan defense has just an absolutely phenomenal game and it's a slugfest Oh yeah, Texas can still win. They can do that. They have a great offensive line. I think they're able to run the ball well enough. Steve Sarkeesian is very clever. If you get into third and fours, third and threes, I think he's got some great RPO concepts that can move the sticks in critical situations. So there's only one way for Michigan to win the game. You keep it low scoring. You run the football incredibly well. Texas, I can give you several different ways. Your defense smothers Davis Warren, and they're not able to run the football with any amount of success, and Warren is just not that capable at this point in time in the season, perhaps later in the year. I'd have more confidence in Michigan in this game if it were like week six, seven. I just think they're going through too much transition, and Texas has got way too much certainty, way too much clarity for me to feel good about picking Michigan in this game, particularly with the Quinn Ewers-Davis Warren debacle. Now, debacle, situation, comparison, call it whatever you like. I like Quinn Ewers. I don't think he's going to win the Heisman Trophy this year, but I like Quinn Ewers. He's in his third year with Texas. This is not his first go-round. Davis Warren, on the other hand, This is his first go-round with this coaching staff and his first go-round as a starter. I have been consistent, and I am sticking to my guns here. Continuity over new. It was true with Notre Dame and Texas A&M last week. It has been true in several other instances. It doesn't mean plug-and-play new starting quarterbacks can't work in certain situations. I was not impressed with Michigan's passing game last week. I don't think they're going to be able to run for 300 yards the way they did against Washington against this Texas front seven. And I think Texas can win with a ground game. Texas Texas can win on the back of Quinn Ewers. You got to stay stay away from Will Johnson. Man, that guy's good. <laughs> that guy is really good. If my NFL team, if my beloved Seahawks tank this year and end up picking in the top 10, I would love for them to get Will Johnson. So stay away from number two. But you can win the game on the back of Quinn Ewers. You can win with a run game, or you can win with your defense. Michigan, they can only win with their defense and running the football just well enough. But I don't think that's going to be easy. I think Texas wins this football game. I thought that coming into the year. I feel better about it now. Colorado State is not a bad Mountain West team. They're expected to be respectable this year. Fresno State perhaps slightly better. But any way you slice it, Texas is more impressive in week one. Now, That's the time to make observations rather than conclusions. But holistically, this Texas team is far more ready to compete. If they go into Michigan, who is a good team, I think they are an eight, nine win team this year with a a very Jekyll and Hyde Big Ten schedule. They are either playing a high profile game or they're playing someone who they're going to beat very badly. You know, they've got the Michigan game, the Ohio State game, the Oregon game and the USC game, maybe the Washington game. Every other game, eh, they're, you're, you're gonna, Michigan's going to win. Michigan's going to be fine. I think they're a very high floor team with Sharon Moore and the team that they do have to put on the field this year. But I think there's too much turnover versus continuity with Texas. I love the offensive line headlined by Kelvin Banks. I think Texas goes into Michigan this week and proves themselves to be a national title contender. I think they go in and make a statement sort of victory. Give me the Longhorns. By double digits, seven and a half points, don't care. I will swallow it with my prediction here. Longhorns, 27. Wolverines, 13. Two touchdown victory. 
You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel any time. For that $5 bet, you could look at an NFL future. Everyone wants to be a number one receiver who will lead all wide receivers in yards. FanDuel has three players with odds 9-1 to one or shorter. FanDuel has Tyreek Hill, the favorite to lead the league in receiving at plus 650. CeeDee Lamb right behind him doesn't have a contract. Plus 750. And then Justin Jefferson checks in at 9-1. to one. Interestingly enough, both Amon Ross St. Brown and Jamar Chase have 11-1 to one odds. And I like both of those a lot. So I'm going to say Brown in particular on that one. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Can Texas take it to Michigan? Does Arkansas have a shot against Okie State? You're talking ball with the SEC squad. From Alabama to Tennessee, from Georgia to Oklahoma, from Auburn to Texas. In SEC Week 1, as the conference goes 13-3, and three, it's all in how you spin it, though. Some other folks saying, no, they only won three out of their four big games. However you want to spin it, but we got some big ones happening this week. And, guys, uh, let's get into it as we have uh, an awesome slate of games. And uh, first, I want to give a little roses to our guy, Corey Burton, locked on Vandy. Corey, I don't think anybody had uh, – other than Chris Marler, I think gave uh, Vandy yeah, Chris. Virginia. Shout out, Chris. Vandy over Virginia Tech. Maybe Stephen Thank Willis. You. Jay is, uh, also brought it up. Yeah. Jay. Shout out, right. Steve. Maybe, maybe a few of us were taking Vandy. I um, mm-hmm. didn't get to the sports book in time to get the bet in, but <laughs> shout out to uh, Vandy. Corey, we'll give you 30 seconds off the top to take your roses. Well, man, Diego Pavia, I, I think everybody's learning how great he is. Uh, that, that was an incredible performance, something that I saw coming from a mile away because of uh, what he did in New Mexico State. And uh, what he did to poor Zach's uh, Auburn team last year. Um, we, uh, man, the defense played aggressively. They had identity. That that was probably the most physical, fast, aggressive Vanderbilt team that I've seen in quite some time. So uh, it was really, really good to see. Okay. I was. You were just about out of time. That was all the time we could allocate to Vanderbilt Perfect. conversation this week. But <laughs> great win, and let's see if they can get more. Look. If they can take care of business next two weeks, we're talking about a 3-0 Vandy team going into Mizzou oh, with a know. chance to pull off a monster upset in a few weeks. So we'll oh, certainly okay. get to that one here. Missouri, you're next. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get to this one first, guys, because I see our buddy John Neighbors is here, host of Lockdown Razorbacks. And, guys, um, Arkansas, big one. They are on the road. They are underdogs at Oklahoma State. I think sitting at about a 7.5-point underdog at FanDuel. John, how are we feeling? Hogs looked really good. What was it, 70 points you scored? I mean, the offense looks good. Bobby Petrino's back. How are we feeling? Well, uh, my old phrase of coining Hogs by 90 almost came true. Uh, honestly, if they would have, but see, Arkansas is a classy program. They they just had the quarters run out five minutes early before they destroyed a few other classless programs, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, but here's the thing, Arkansas and Oklahoma State, this is pretty, pretty much the biggest game of the year for Sam Pittman. I think most people have felt that way because mm-hmm. Arkansas wins this game. They're basically going to be 3-0 heading into a road game against Auburn. If they lose this game, they're already way behind the eight ball. And it's going to be hard to come out of it, especially if they're trying to get to postseason play. So this one's a huge one. I think Razorback fans feel pretty confident. I mean, you score 70 and you allow the other team to score zero. I don't care who it is, especially if you're a Razorback fan. Hasn't happened very often. So the fact that you got it gives you a little bit of confidence, but there's no doubt that it's going to be a really tough match and a really tough game for Sam Pittman. It's going to be a lot of fun to see what Arkansas does. And uh, let me jump to each of you guys real quick this segment. Just ask you to make a quick prediction about your team and your game. Doesn't have to be a score prediction, but just something you're looking to see from your team this weekend. Steven, we'll start with you. I want to see if Jackson Dark can have a first half the way he had against Furman, essentially. Fun fact on that Furman game, they asked him if Lane Kiffin if he wanted to go short quarters or a running clock in the second half, and Lane Kiffin said no. <laughs> 
Well, shout out to Furman. Yeah. I heard they just got an invite up to 4A in high school. So uh, good, uh, <laughs> good for them. Clint, uh, prediction for the Bulldogs this week. We're going to see more freshmen than we did last week against Clemson play out this week because of the opponent. But you're going to see guys like Justin Williams. If you don't know the name, go ahead and get used to it because he showed out a little bit. You're going to go guys like that who are 17, 18 year old kids who are going to completely tell you that the next three years are going to be run by Georgia and you're going to get sick of it. And I don't even care. All right. He's been doing that for 42 years, though. So, I mean, after this year, of course. Yeah. 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 Give me a prediction on Mizzou. Well, Missouri, big favorites against Buffalo. Tigers start off the Corey Batoon era as defensive coordinator with a shutout against Murray State. Like to see more good defense this week. Also, if there's one thing to complain about offensively, Brady Cook a little too strong on some of his deep shots. I think that was just maybe a little early season thing. Dial it in. We'll see in week two. John, you say that. I watched Joe Milton play football last year, so you know, we all said that week one, Touché. week two, but it's something that falls. There's a little bit of an yeah. arm difference uh, there between Brady Cook like and Joe Milton, but knee. fair enough, fair enough. He's on a knee. He could chuck that thing to the opposite <laughs> side of the field. Which 90 is yards. He can Jamarcus throw an orange Russell, at 180 yards. Come on. Do y'all, do y'all know the greatest Joe Milton joke ever? Do it. If you need a quarterback to throw the ball at 40 yards, Joe Milton can throw a ball 40 yards. If you need a quarterback to throw at 10 yards, Joe Milton can throw the ball 40 yards. Every time. Yeah. It's very true. And as we know, in the NFL, they're at, they ask you a lot of times to, to get on your knees and throw it 80 yards. It happens Absolutely. all the time. Yeah. All the time. Right. Eric, That's why give me Marcus thought. Russell is an all-time great. <laughs> Sometimes they exactly. need orange to throw. <laughs> Eric, give me a thought on the uh, the Vols and my Heisman pick, Nico Iamaliava. The orange went over 100 yards, by the way. Uh, yeah, Tennessee. Western Carolina had nine TFLs against NC State last week. They were leading NC State into the fourth quarter. I think NC State's going to play much better. But if Western Carolina got nine TFLs against NC State, Tennessee's defensive line is going to get at least 13 or 14. No joke. Uh, Tennessee by two scores. I think Casey Concepcion is going to give Tennessee's defense a whole lot of issues. But I like Tennessee by two scores against NC State. Neutral field. Um, hopefully they don't bring out the mayonnaise, though. That's kind of gross. Corey, don't know a ton about Alcorn State, but give me a prediction for Vandy this week. Well, Vandy has got some things uh, offensively that they can still work on. Vertical passing game. Um, and continue to improve the, the option game with Pavia and the running back. So just looking to get a little bit stronger um, as they uh, get ready for uh, Georgia State the following week and Missouri uh, as their first conference game. Corey, it's good to know that Vanderbilt still has some things to work on after that win. Good to yeah, know. Yeah. I thought they were a finished product. <laughs> they hey, are. We, if they win this yeah. week, we call that a winning, a winning streak. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive for Vanderbilt. Well, honestly, honestly, the most free money thing in the history of free money was Vandy over two and a half wins. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. I, I tell you. I, oh I, yeah. I had the fan duel on that one. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I took that one too. I was in Louisiana. That one is definitely one that you wanted to lay hands on because, again, that, that was free money. Well, oh, wait till they lose at Georgia State. Then we'll all be sweating that one out until the end of the year. Jay Smith, <laughs> give me a prediction for the Sooners this week. Fun fact for the Sooners, we held um, Temple to under 200 yards. First time we've done that since 2017, the first year we had Lincoln Riley. That's why if you wonder why, you know, people have some angst with Lincoln. So my prediction in this game, another under 200-yard game allowed. Defense goes out there and dominates. Hey, hey, Willie drinker or call a therapist every time Jay brings up Lincoln Riley. Yeah. That, that, that's almost a drinking it's game. a drinking game guys what are you doing come on now you're failing me thing. he didn't say tell how bad of a defense you've had since those times He's right like, right <laughs> <laughs> willie fritz was great at Tulane. it's gonna take him a while to get going there at houston jonathan davis you got a big one we're gonna preview that one in a little bit but give me a prediction for texas this week Right. So many SEC teams playing absolute scrubs this weekend. Right. But Texas this weekend proves they are who we think they are. Right. Since both teams have played this past weekend, we've seen the spread jump from minus three and a half to Texas favored by seven and a half on the road in the big house. No Jim Harbaugh, no J.J. McCarthy, no Connor Stallions. The Longhorns exposed the Wolverines this weekend on the road. We're waiting on it. Yeah. Texas needs to take care of business or else Danny Cannell is going to look like Randy from South Park. (laughs) <laughs> let's jump to chris marler uh, man old dominion didn't see that one coming but the gamecocks got it done what give me a prediction for the gamecocks this week emotionally they did not uh gordy that is one thing that is for sure uh, i'll tell you what it's going to be hard to win every week if left if you only can get two turnovers inside of their own 10 yard line which is what they managed to do 
and still only pull out a four point win over Old Dominion. I will say this Old Dominion, in their last two years, they played four power power opponents. They've won one of them, and two of the other three, they only lost by three or less points. So, pretty elite company uh, for South Carolina. I think that uh, they're going to need a lot of help, and they're going to need Lenora Sellers to calm the blank down uh, if they go to Lexington to get a win. Looks yeah. real bad. Yeah, Lenore's dropping down our SEC quarterback rankings very quickly after week one. Uh, see if he can rebound. John Neighbors, quick uh, just prediction for Arkansas this week. Not on the game score, but just prediction for the for what the uh, Razorbacks uh, can do this week. Maybe Andrew Armstrong, is he back? Uh, I, I, I think he will be. But in the words of my hero, Bobby Petrino, that was fun. We didn't come to paint. We came to win. And that's what Arkansas is going to do in this game. They're going to win this one. And honestly, it might be between the battle of who you'd rather have a couple of cold beers and have a smoke a couple of heaters with Mike Gundy and Sam Pittman going at it. But I like Sam Pittman. He's cooler. He's more fun and he's more entertaining. So that yeah, reason he alone. He doesn't drive either. So that's no, nice. That's true. He doesn't. He doesn't drive and uh, he likes to hang out. But no, I actually think Arkansas wins this game. I really do because I'm an idiot. And they'll probably be, have a great high scoring game ever in the Big 12. But Hogs get it done. And then Razorback fans feel really good for a second until their heart gets sucked out of their body once again at some point. So, so just what? to be clear, you're you're no longer looking for new coaches on LinkedIn jobs for Sam Pittman's replacement or well, yeah, tabled well, that or I mean Rhett Lashley lost it, so he's out. Uh <laughs> so yeah, there's a few of them that were in the mix, but no. Uh isn't he on the roster now? I mean on the coaching staff now? Uh no, I don't think the next I don't coached. Know. Barry the next Odom's coach? off to a good start. Yeah. It's like UNLV. A, there could be a few of other ones. Aren't, yeah. you, aren't you wearing the shirt of the person that's not oh, starting? Exactly. The one that is going to get the job is already on your is on your chest right now. So. It ain't happening. It ain't happening because you know why? Bobby Petrino does not do NIL, so it's not happening. <laughs>